Hey, you know, it looks like we need to color correct that camera number four there. <laughs> it's pretty bad off. Hey, welcome. Uh, we're live from the SCC studios in White Bear Lake, also playing live in St. Paul over SPNN. We're glad to have you here. And this show is also played elsewhere around the state, uh, delayed. Uh, but uh, you can watch this show at any time. Uh, the re well, reruns. It's on YouTube. Uh, so if you go youtube.com backslash speechless MN or forward slash speechless MN, you will be able to watch the show. Okay, uh, a lot today. The main topic is uh, Michelle McDonald, who ran for the Minnesota Supreme Court. Her appellate court case on appealing four uh, issues, a couple of them constitutional. Uh, came back and they basically, court uh, was not very nice to her, uh, which was too bad and you're gonna see why. And this is one of the game that goes on in the appellate courts and the court situation is that the court changes the storyline. They change the facts and they misrepresent what's actually being appealed. So it's, it's unbelievable what they did in this case. In particular, we're going to talk about cameras in the courtroom and then what the word immediately means. Okay, so, um, and because she asked, as the statute says, to go immediately before a judge. Uh, and they, the officers wouldn't let her. Well, uh, that was uh, upheld. Uh, by the court that the officers didn't have to take her and you'll just see the mental gymnastics that take place in that decision. Uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, we're going to also play some of the video we showed last week because we'll set up uh, the Michelle McDonald case uh, where Eric Cardle was dealing with an order for protection and we see how these judges manipulate and change the argument right there as to something that's not even being argued. And so <laughs> it's pretty fascinating. Uh, also, Scalia's death. Uh, we'll talk about the impact of that. And thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. We have um, a big day coming up, March 1st. You need to save that date and don't be late. Your liberty's at stake. Uh, this is an important day, March 1st, because it's your precinct caucuses. People will be gathering to decide who they want to have represent a certain political party. They'll be deciding what the party platforms will be. That's the beginning of the process. If you're not there March 1st, you forfeit a lot of your time and energy in trying to manipulate people or trying to persuade people to your beliefs because right there at March 1st is the one day every two years that you can gather with your neighbors and say, hey, here's what we want to do. And if you're not there, you're not part of the discussion and you don't get to vote yay or nay. Matter of fact, if you're not there March 1st, your vote for president who you want to be president won't count until people eliminate the choices you have to vote, to who to vote for president. But on March 1st, you could vote for whoever you want to and you can have your say. Uh, you may not win, but at least you had your say. And so that's why that March 1st is so important and people miss that. And it's important uh, for you to show up this time in particular because of the death of Justice Scalia. And Justice Scalia, uh, known as an originalist, um, and going by what the Constitution said, what the Founders meant, uh, passed away. And basically what this changes is the whole dynamic of the presidential election. Now we're really not elect, we're electing a president, but we're also electing a president who's going to put somebody on the Supreme Court. And so whoever that president, whether it's a corporatist, whether it's a socialist, a communist, uh, 
a, a libertarian, a constitutionalist, a conservative, um, that, that individual will have a lot of sway over the, the court, that president. And then, of course, once that judge is in office, they'll do whatever they want. But this could very well be the end of freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and um, freedom of the press, depending on which justice goes in. And if it's going to be another liberal justice uh, like we've seen, then these four areas will be greatly, greatly diminished. Very, very well could be, and America will be no more. Um, already a number of our rights are taken away, and uh, you're going to see that with the justices that are uh, in our appellate court here in Minnesota and the dirty tricks they do. I mean, these, these guys are scoundrels, I mean, for what they have done. And, and how they play this game and won't answer the question that's brought before them. And, and they know what they're doing too. They, there's no confusion there. They know what they're doing. And we'll, hopefully I can point that out today. Okay. You know, because it involves me. You know, it involves you. It involves your right to see this show. It involves your right to hear what's going on so you can follow the trail to see that in district court something else was argued than what the appellate court is saying took place. And it's amazing. You know, there was nothing in this appellate court record that said the uh, uh, sheriff said, uh, the, the, the police officers that pulled uh, Michelle McDonald over uh, lied about her being under arrest, that she really wasn't, but they said it anyway. There's nothing in there. So they changed the facts and changed the circumstances. We'll go through that. Okay, people, if you don't uh, go March 1st for your precinct caucus, then somebody else is going to determine your life. All right. Um, a acquaintance uh, called and uh, about made some comments about the show and especially about uh, my comments about the Muslim faith, the Muslim people, and uh, was doing a lot of what I call name calling. Um, wasn't laying out any facts. You know, you, you did this. You know, it was, you're, you're being um, that I, and I may not have the exact words here, but I hate Muslims, or um, I'm mean-spirited towards the Muslims. Uh, they, you don't like them, and that 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 is not the case. Okay, uh, that individual, that human being, that person who is of the Muslim faith, that individual, I respect, I care about, uh, compassion for, compassionate about, uh, that is a human being created by God for His glory, for God to decide what to do with, okay? The individual, the person is, is important, but just like any white male Christian person who has beliefs that are harmful, to other people, um, they, I, I don't, I don't go there. Okay, I don't accept that person for what they are doing and and what they believe. If it's going to be harmful and contrary to God's word, the the Bible. Okay, so the individual themselves. You know, you, you'll try to relate to, try to have a conversation, you know. But when they do say things like, you know, uh, kill the infidel, this is the Muslim faith now, okay? This is Muhammad. This is in the Hadith, you know. These are, this is part of Muhammad's teaching and how he treated women and how he treats infidels and give them a chance to repent if they don't repent, cut off their head. That's 
a Muslim. That's what they have to believe. So just like a Catholic who's pro-choice, they're not Catholics. Okay? They, they deny their own faith. So I think there's a lot of good, when I use the word good Muslim, what I mean is there's a lot of people of the Muslim faith who are good people who don't practice their Muslim faith, okay? Uh, the Muslim who practices their faith will be doing what takes place with the beheadings, with the, uh, the taxes, on, the higher taxes on the infidels, the um, slavery, the, the raping of children, that's a, that's a real Muslim. That's one that is actually following Muhammad and his faith. And you, and you have to understand it. That is not a radical Muslim. That's a normal Muslim. Okay? The, the Muslims, the majority of the Muslims, don't follow the Muslim faith. Okay? Just like there's a lot of Catholics that don't follow the Catholic faith, and there's a lot of Christians that don't follow the Christian faith. Adultery is not a problem for them. Okay, but they'll call themselves Christians, you know. And they can say whoever they want to be, you know, and whatever beliefs they have, but their behavior contradicts that. So, um, I love the human, love the person, not the belief, because that belief says, I die. Okay, because I won't accept Allah as... God. <clears throat> so they have the right then to kill me. Is that mean-spirited? Telling the truth mean-spirited? No. So one of the, the comments says was made, there are different sects. N not all Muslims are of the same sect. Well, of course, we know the main ones, the Sunni, uh, the Sunni and the Shiite, okay? And they're at war with each other. Uh, for their reasons, so they're <clears throat> not really loving each other there. But there are sects of the Muslim faith that don't um, respond to that, don't believe in, in, the, in the violence part. Uh, and that I would say, yeah, they're not Muslim. Just like Jehovah Witnesses aren't Christians, they're polytheists, they believe in many gods, just as uh, Mormons aren't Christians because their definition of Jesus Christ and definition of God is different than uh, traditional Christianity <laughs> as it's laid out in the Bible. It's different. They're, they're, those are more cults uh, situations. Well, I consider the Muslim faith to be a cult. They redefine God in a different manner than the God of Christianity, okay? Um, so th th the point is, you can say, I'm a Jehovah Witness and I'm a Christian. Well, no, you can't, okay? You're a Jehovah Witness. You, you know, you're, you believe in many gods. So there's, there's that distinction out there. So if there's a sect of the Muslim faith that doesn't believe in beheading the infidels, they're not Muslim. And, and that's, that's great. That's better for everybody, themselves and the persons they're not beheading. So are there really nice Muslim people out there? Absolutely, there's tons of them. <laughs> nice Muslim people who have no intention of ever uh, beheading, buddy, beheading anybody or raping people. But again, those aren't, the, those aren't Muslims. Okay, and so, you know, it's just a, a huge, huge distinction that needs to be made. And it may not go well for me, uh, but that's, it, it will in the end, you know. So I would love to have any conversation with any Muslim about what Muhammad said about Jesus, what Muhammad said about Mary, uh, how, Jesus, how Muhammad respected Jesus, taught about him being the greatest prophet and um, 
in about Muhammad's behavior. I, <clears throat> we can have that discussion. Um, if you want to see a series on Muhammad, go watch a series called What Would Muhammad Do? Or watch a series on the uh, um, Muslim Brotherhood put out by Voice of Resistance, uh, Randall Terry. Um, and you'll, you'll get a great education on, on the Muslim faith and, and how it acts and how it behaves. So just to, to my call, I appreciate the calls, appreciate the input. And, you know, sometime I should uh, have, uh, if a Muslim guest wants to come on and talk and, and have a discussion, that'd be great. Uh, we can do that. Okay. Um, so let's go then um, and play the video. This is Eric Cardell, an attorney who's argued before the U.S. Supreme Court on free speech rights for judges <laughs> running for election in Minnesota. And won at the U.S. Supreme Court in a 5-4 to four decision, lost all the way up. I just want you to, you're not going to see it here, but in the next clip you're going to see the attitude of the judge towards... Um, Eric Cardle, in particular Judge Kirk. This is personal to Judge Kirk. That's what's going on. This is a personal issue. It's not let's figure out the law, see if things have been violated and, and go there. This is a personal issue. You didn't you didn't file the papers, you didn't do a temporary restraining order, uh, harassment restraining order. You didn't do the what I wanted you to do or what I think you should have done. Even though the law says you could do another process, that's not the one you should have done. You should have done something else. Well, no, the law allows him, allows Eric's client to do a certain procedure, and this judge didn't like it. Now, we're going to set this up by um, an interesting thing that happens in court cases where if you file a motion before the court and bring in an affidavit to the court and the other side doesn't respond, there's usually a summary judgment in your favor. Okay? This is what happened in the grazini rucky divorce case. Sandra Grazzini brought a motion for a divorce. Uh, husband had signed off on it. There's no counter motion. The judge approved of it. Okay? Here's, here's a, a, a man filing the motion to amend the findings on a, a harassment restraining order and to then, because of changes of circumstances, eliminate the harassment restraining order because it served out its usefulness. And so he files a motion, files an affidavit. There is no response. Okay, and that's where we come into where this video kind of picks up understanding that. So let's, let's watch what this video has to say. Uh, may it please the court. My, uh, uh, first of all, uh, I did acknowledge the abuse of discretion standard. Uh, I just said that as a general matter, uh, whether a, a court can make credibility determinations without an evidentiary hearing is one that can be reviewed de novo, sort of an automatically an abuse of discretion. That occurred here. With respect to Addendum 6, if we look at uh, the sort of the selectively quoting two parts of the affidavit, but not addressing the whole affidavit. That should be very disconcerting to an appellate court when you have allegations of self-serving affidavit, even though it's unrebutted, and you have the uh, uh, trial uh, uh, judge here signing off on just two parts of a very extensive affidavit. That's very disconcerting. With respect to the respondent's use of Costello and Varner v. Varner, this is the sentence that was read at page 14, but the district court, as the finder of fact, is not required to believe uncontradicted testimony if there are any reasonable grounds to doubt its credibility. <coughs> the, the only connection between those cases and the respondent's arguments are uncontradicted testimony. Because when the court acts as a finder of fact, that's based on an evidentiary hearing. The court cannot, without an evidentiary hearing, make credibility determinations regarding an aff unrebutted affidavit. Now, again, I conceded. If there had been an evidentiary hearing previously in this proceeding, 
that a, a, even a different judge could take that credibility determination from the earlier ruling and apply it to the affidavit later. I don't have a problem with that. This is really huge. You, you got to understand something here. What happens in a lot of these harassment restraining orders, a person who has been accused of doing something realizes the marriage is over, um, things are different now, um, they realize the relationship is severed, so now what I need to do is just get out of this thing. I can go and spend five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 to fight the harassment restraining order or the order for protection, or I can just say, I'm done with this person, I'm leaving, you know, let, let, let there be a restraining order for two years, okay, harassment restraining order, order for protection for two years. I don't care, I'm not gonna see this person anyway, so I'll just agree to it, I save myself five, ten thousand dollars $10,000, walk away. Okay, so in that situation, there is no evidentiary hearing. Okay, there, there, none of that takes place. So there's no findings of fact, whether it's true or not. Now, a person could say, boy, yeah, I did this, and I'm, you know, I'm going to be guilty of it, so I might as well just go with it, save, save the money too. You know, I, I admit to doing it, you know. Well, in, in a lot of these, it's saying, no, I, I don't admit to it, but, you know, we're, we're, uh, <clears throat> we'll just let it be. I'm out of here, okay? So no evidentiary hearing, and you're not stipulating to the facts, okay? You, you're, you're coming to a conclusion, here's what we agree to. So in this particular case, you had a, a couple of people, uh, who um, one person wanted a uh, order for protection, and the other person said, no, this is, this is ridiculous, okay? I didn't do anything. You know I didn't do anything. You're just scamming the system. So make, make it a one-year harassment restraining order, you know? I mean, and I'm gone, you know? I'm, I'm got my plans, okay, which in this case was sell his home, uh, go to a safe home situation where she can't find out where he is at, so she won't harass him, leave him alone, and we're done, okay, and she wasn't going to accept that, so they came to an agreement of a two-year harassment restraining order, which you don't really need any evidence for, <laughs> okay, so... In the meantime, she goes out and says, uh, and goes into his uh, records through driver's license, finds his record, finds out where he lives, and is doing some harassment of him on uh, Facebook or whatever, just saying a whole bunch of bad things. And so now he files his motion to amend saying, look, I separated myself. I did everything I can do, but she's still coming after me. This harassment restraining order to protect her is meaningless. Okay? So just get rid of it. She can't find me, you know. Uh, let's just get rid of this and let's move on because it, it affects your job. You know, it's what I tell people. If you get a harassment restraining order, you get an order for protection out on you, you need to fight it tooth and nail. Okay, you just have to because it affects so many things. But, you know, the other issue is since we have no really any basis for findings of fact, the, the, the standard of legal standard to prove for a harassment restraining order is so low that just the allegation is enough to get you one, you know, and to have a judge say, okay, you know, you, you got one, you want one, you got one. You know, and, and it's rare that they're turned down. So, um, the point here I want to show, and you'll see, is the judge starts changing the scenarios of what took place or what the individual should have done. So let's watch this. Uh, well, <clears throat> the, the key thing here is they're talking about uncontradicted testimony. So in these 
agreements that come into play in harassment restraining orders, um, there is no there is no evidentiary hearing, and so when you file a motion and and a judge says an extensive motion and only answers two of the questions, and then says, um, I don't believe in your motion, and there's been no evidentiary hearing, uh, I don't find this credible. Well, you have to have an evidentiary hearing in order to find it not credible. It was just an affidavit. He said, I don't find it credible. But the whole point is that there was never an evidentiary hearing at all. And so what's happening in these, in these harassment restraining orders and people uh, agreeing to them is down the road, it's as if you did what you've been charged with. Okay, even though you haven't agreed to it, you just, and, and there's never been any evidence. And so it shows up that you did this uh, dastardly deed and you know there's never been ev any evidence of it, but it just doesn't matter. Okay, and Eric Cardle is fighting a good fight here because this is a problem. Every judge knows it's a problem, and, but they don't care, you know, don't agree to it. <laughs> um, there's no evidentiary hearing. You got to have it. So the abuse of discretion in the judge's part is that he didn't have an evidentiary hearing and it said, made a finding that the affidavit was not only self serving but also um, didn't lack any, any merit because it was self-serving. But where's the evidentiary? Where, where's the ability to ask question witnesses and cross-examine and all that? You know, it, it wasn't there. Okay, so let's go on to the video here and see what he has to say. Here, <clears throat> what specifically is the change of circumstances from the moment that the order was initially signed? Let's use one, uh, the plaintiff's misconduct uh, that's alleged uh, uh, getting into his private data. How does, how does that impact whether she's entitled to relief against him? It may impact whether he has a right to bring a similar action against her, but she wasn't restrained from doing anything as it relates to him as part of this initial order. If a, if a, uh, if a, uh, a beneficiary of an injunction uh, violates... This isn't uh, an injunction, it's a harassment. If the harassment restored or violates the rights of another party, that's a change of circumstances. It shows intent. He also asserted... No, you're wrong on that, Counsel. It is not. Explain to me how it is. How does it ch that change her need to be protected from him? It may create a need for him to be protected from her, but it doesn't change her need. Uh, what, There's obviously a problem in this relationship. That's why the order was issued. Uh, yes, and the, 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 the court asked for a change of circumstance. This occurred afterwards. Uh, and, and I was using But how that does that change a, anything related to her need for protection? Okay, from and that, so that's a different question. And, and, and on that question, it, it changes the relationship. Ostensibly, uh, she was a victim. Now he's a victim. So that would well, of course... Well, now he claims he's a victim, but the way to establish that is to bring his own harassment restraining order. Uh, he no, certainly had the right to do that. And he had a right to bring this <clears> motion, <throat> as the lower court found. And he pointed well, why, to... Why, he, why? We often have mutual restraining orders between parties where there's been action on both sides. We don't vacate one. Uh, all right. So my, my client comes forward with an affidavit, uh, Judge Kirk, and says, this uh, in continuing harassment restraining order is not necessary. There's no benefit to her. And, and there's damage minute, to me. There was some horse trading that went on at that first hearing. She, she came in looking for an OFP. He obviously didn't want an OFP, and for a lot of reasons. An OFP creates a, a lot of circumstances that are different than a harassment order. He negotiates for a harassment order. She agrees. They negotiate a two-year term. That was part of the agreement. He could have perhaps gotten it a one-year agreement, maybe didn't pursue that. Maybe his attorney should have. The fact of the matter is there was this give and take, and they ended up with an agreement that this is the route that would be used to you know, deal with the friction left in this relationship.
I think he pursued a one year and ended up getting a two year. But going along with the analogy, because uh, well, I think it's the good record thing. says that they stipulated to a two year. Am, am I wrong on that? I I, I, I can't. I don't. I don't remember that specifically. I'm just based on my. I'd, I'd have to go back and look. I don't have time. But I believe it, he, somewhere it says he won one year. But anyway, with respect to your, the analogy then of the contract, then we have to go all the way, and that would be and, and consider the implied uh, duty of good faith and fair dealing. And there, of course, then this isn't a we, this is a harassment restraining order under the criminal code, six hundred nine, chapter six hundred nine. It's not a civil contract. Uh, Judge, Kirchner, I was uh, addressing uh, your point of uh, comparing it to a contract, and I was agreeing with you that we, we go we go with that, and we go with your example, your metaphor. And I'm just saying that the change of circumstances she breached by accessing his data and doing other these things that are unrebutted. So if you have an agreement and then you have the petitioners, the beneficiary of the agreement, violating it after the agreement, then that can be raised as an issue. But the general point well, is... You're missing the point. It, it doesn't go to whether or not the restraining order was still appropriate for her. And there's nothing in the record that tells us that. If, if we were to accept your position any time a uh, person who's a subject of a harassment restraining order had had five minutes of good behavior, he could say, well, there's been a change of circumstance. I haven't harassed her in the last five minutes. I mean, where, where do you draw the line when you have an agreement that it's going to be a specific term? It's that specific term. Well, I, 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 well, I, I indicated that when we agreed that change of circumstances would be on one instance, and we have an unrebutted affidavit where she violated his federal rights to information, that would be the kind of change of circumstance where you'd say, yeah, we have to look into this. We have to hear a hearing. But generally speaking, the presentation, uh, Judge Kirk, that was made through the affidavit that was unrebutted was this injunction has out, you, you, out, you, utilize, out, uh, been spent. Its usefulness has been spent with time, and there's no usefulness in it going forward. And that was unrebutted. And so the, so the case was made it's not useful anymore to her. And then there wasn't an affidavit coming back. And the way that the American legal system works is if you don't have that affidavit, the advocacy of the lawyer is worthless. That's all. Thank you. Well argued. You <laughs> I mean, that last statement was critical. The way the American system works, if, if you don't have an affidavit, the what, I forget how he said it, the uh, uh, lawyer is worthless, you know. Um, advocacy the, for a lawyer is worthless. The advocacy for, the advocacy, uh, for a lawyer is worthless without an affidavit. So the, there's nothing for the lawyer to go on. Uh, having a lawyer is meaningless because you can't have an affidavit anyway. Uh, you know, it's, it's just a whole hodgepodge of problem here in, in, in the court system that's going on. And what was interesting is Kirk, Judge Kirk, kept changing the scenario. It's a contract. It's not a contract. It's, you know, it's a, a stipulated order. It's, uh, you know, they agreed upon it. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's uh, it's an it's not an injunction. It's it's an injunction. You know, all over, okay. Uh, we got a phone call coming here, so uh, we'll get to that here real quick. Um, so it, it just Judge Kirk was just saying, I wanted you to do it this way. You should have filed a harassment restraining order. You could have done that. Well, there was this other option. The other option was we got to change the circumstances. And Judge Kirk wasn't even going to acknowledge that. And if you say there's a change in circumstances, then the judge needs to acknowledge everything in that affidavit and answer all those issues and have an evidentiary hearing. But instead, the judge just threw it out. And, th and that's not right. Okay, the person doesn't even get a chance to get into court uh, to, to hear that. This is a real significant battle going on in that courtroom right now or that, that took place uh, last week. And um, uh, we'll, see what, we'll see what happens. But we got a caller on the line. Uh, caller, you got a comment or question? Uh, yes, thank you, Tim. This is Diana Longrie. Yeah, hi, Diana. And, 
Hi. You know, you and I, we talked a little bit about this, but now that I have seen the video, <laughs> I've got a couple of other comments. Okay. And that I know that he was trying to explain that the change of circumstances is that based upon the woman's actions of trying to seek this guy out, she is no longer fearful. Right. That that's the change of circumstances. However, you know what? I think that I probably, if, if you know, being the backseat driver, ha-ha. Oh. Um, <laughs> no, there's none, there's none here either. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would have coupled it with the idea that there was a fraud upon the court. Oh, and yeah. The circumstances is that there was a fraud upon the court. Right. Because in my experience, if somebody is fearful... They remain fearful for a very long time. Right. They don't suddenly decide, oh, gee whiz, I think I'm going to look him up and just make his life a living hell. Right, and illegally look him up. Well, that, well that's true, too. They're going to, ex to uh, circumstances beyond uh, what is legal to find this person out. And so I would have coupled it with that idea that there was actually a change of circumstances is that actually this, is demonstra this demonstrates there was a fraud upon the court and that she really wasn't fearful and that it was an abusive process and that she was just using the process in a way to harass somebody because that's the way she felt at that time because of the deterioration of the relationship. Yeah. So I don't, you know, once you get to the appellate court, everybody can be a backseat driver. Yeah. You know, I've been there in other cases myself. I go, oh, gee whiz, why didn't I say that? But, yeah. You know, well, that's just my thoughts in, in seeing the film footage now. Yeah, super. <laughs> well, eventually that whole hearing will be online. You'll see more of it. But, yeah, I mean, I mean you got 15 minutes and then five minutes for rebuttal. So that could have been in there. In, in the brief and everything, who knows? Uh, we're, we're not right. sure, we're not sure whether it was there. He did talk about abuse of discretion of the judge, uh, who didn't give an evidentiary hearing. Somewhere in here, there needs to be an evidentiary hearing. <laughs> well, and I agree with that too. Is that you can't just rely upon affidavits because you cannot cross-examine an affidavit, and people make all kinds of allegations in affidavits, and unless you're able to cross-examine that. You cannot determine what is accurate or inaccurate in an affidavit. Right, e exactly. And but you'll find judges playing this game of, oh, I got an affidavit here. Well, Your Honor, I where I want the person who wrote the affidavit here, so I can <laughs> question them. Uh, and, and these harassment restraining orders, no, don't need to have them. You know that doesn't mm -hmm. matter. You don't get to cross-examine them. Well, you're, uh, you know, it's just amazing that they do that. All right, thank you, caller. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, this is, a, this is a setup for what's going on in the cameras in the courtroom in the Michelle McDonald case. Um, it's just kind of how a judge can very easily, and you saw that happening there, change the circumstances of the case and telling a person what they should have done when they had a legal option right there in front of him. Um, that that was available. So let's let's go to the uh, McDonald case here, and of course she won a, lost on all her arguments. Uh, I'm gonna kind of scroll up here. It's just interesting the way the question was asked and how the court dealt with the question. Um, so the question that was raised in, in the brief was whether the trial court erred in its ruling on the construction of Minnesota Statute 169.91, uh, opposite authority, Frost versus Commissioner. Um, and so what the, that was the question. This, that, that statute has to deal with uh, whether uh, you get to go immediately before a judge when you're at a traffic stop and getting charged with a misdemeanor or higher. Okay, the law says if you request to go immediately before a judge, they have to take you. I mean, if you read the statute, I mean, it's very clear. It means now, plain language. If you get stopped, and, and then if you ask, I want to see a judge, 
you go immediately. <sighs> Plain language. Anyway, um, and then if you're stopped for DWI, DUI, that type of offense, again, you get to go immediately to a judge. Do they do that? No. Um, but here's how the appellate court said, did Minnesota statute section 169.91 subdivision 1 require the arresting police officer to present the appellant to a judge before he completed all administrative duties attendant to the impaired driving arrest, including administrating the implied consent testing required by section 169A.51? See how they changed everything? Okay, we're dealing with we're dealing with one six nine point nine one, and they add one six nine a point five one, <laughs> and and change the whole question. Okay, that and that's part of what's going. Let's change the scenario as to what really took place. Okay, uh, whether the trial court erred in its ruling not permitting cameras in the courtroom. Okay. Uh, did the, the appellant have a Sixth Amendment right to create a video recording of her trial? Cameras in the courtroom versus create a video recording of her trial. See, the, the changes from a public trial issue to her having, Michelle McDonald, having the right to record her trial for her recording. Create a video recording of her trial. They don't talk about me, the individual, part of the press who asked to videotape the district court hearing and was denied. Therefore, you don't get to see the trial. You don't get to see the testimony of the police officers that said we were lying to her about her being under arrest, you know. And so how do you resist arrest when you're not under arrest, but they say you're under arrest when you're really not? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's just how crazy this is. And so now we can uh, charge you with obstructing arrest for when you weren't under arrest, even though we said you were and you weren't. That's, that's how nuts this is. Okay, so... It's, it's just fascinating, the twisting going on here. Let's see, I uh, get to page 12. Okay, Shimoda, Michelle McDonald Shimoda, moved to record the trial implicitly under Minnesota Rule of General Practice 4.02C, which allows for video recording only if all parties consent. She relied expressly on the Sixth Amendment, not the rule. The district court denied her motion after the state refused to consent. Which, you know, the state's going to refuse to consent. Yeah, you know, they, they don't want to show what they're doing. and They don't want people to know what goes on in the courtroom, in my opinion. Because if the, you know, then you're not going to be as ignorant as to the, the procedures and the tricks and the games they play uh, against you. Um, Shimoda argues that the district court denial, denial violated her Sixth Amendment right to a public trial. This presents a question of constitutional law. We review de novo. Okay, that means we review the law based on the law as it is. Okay, Shimoda offers no authority. This is interesting, okay, in how they spun this. And this was part of the argument, we showed you this part, you know, where the appellate court judge was going, hey, you know, cite in legal authority to support your case. And they said, well, there isn't. Uh, Stephen Grigsby, Michelle uh, McDonald Shimoda's attorney, said, there, well, there is none. No, this hasn't been brought before. Yeah, exactly. You know, the judge says, that's right, you know. Well, that doesn't mean that happens all the time. New issues get brought up. You know, people think of things that aren't right and they bring it up. Okay? I mean, it didn't get brought up for hundreds of years because there, you know, at least a hundred years because there weren't any 
cameras in the courtroom at that point. So the justice says, Shimoda offers no authority, either binding nor persuasive, that holds or suggests that a defendant has a constitutional right to record her own trial. She instead extrapolates the asserted right from other rights. She reminds us that a defendant has the right to a public trial and that allowing cameras in the courtroom constitutes no per se violation of the defendant constitutional right. Okay, uh, so um, see how there's, they don't mention that the press didn't have, wasn't able to film her trial. She, they didn't mention that. This is only about Michelle filming. Okay, but that wasn't the question. Question does, she has a Sixth Amendment right to a public trial so that the press could be in there to film it. Not that she gets it filmed, okay? Uh, and so that whole thing is just kind of pushed aside. So, um, well, we got a phone call here, so uh, let's go with that. Caller, do you have a comment or question? Tim, thanks for the discussion on uh, cameras in the courtroom. Yeah. Because it, they should be in the courtroom. And when they're not in the courtroom, like you say, that allows corruption. The thing that I question is that the state does not necessarily need to take the position that we don't want cameras in the courtroom. I mean, you're right, the state the state legislature should pass a law that says cameras are allowed in the courtroom. Right. And then it would be done. Right. The, the thing is that it's corrupt county attorneys or corrupt <laughs> uh, court administrators who don't want the state to be seen. A good court administrator, a good head judge, right. a good county attorney should think that would be added, that would add to the count, uh, the, the uh, checks and balances and would right. bring for better, more honest, more fair justice and should insist on cameras in the courtroom. Right. So when county attorneys don't put them in there, exactly. it's that they want to be part of the rigged, corrupt, poor system that leads to people not having trust in the justice system. Exactly. Isn't that, I mean, just having the right officials in there could take care right. of it immediately, couldn't it? Exactly. And, and the judge had discretion to overrule the county attorney. Uh, yes, yeah, so the judge. You're right. The judge could do it on his own uh, um, uh, uh, initiative. If, right. Uh, the judge believed in uh, the well-informed public leads to better justice and better democracy. Right. Thank you. Yeah. That very good. Very good comment there. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, and and that should have happened, uh, where the judge should have said, you know what. This is an attorney who's used to being before the camera and used to um, arguing cases in court. And now we got a prosecutor who's a public servant who has, is in court every day arguing cases. And I'm a judge that's way experienced, uh, retired, and brought in on this case to handle this issue. Uh, you know, we're all professionals here. Let's just put it on the camera, see what happens. You know, could have done that. Do we know of any district court case in Minnesota that's had a, allowed a camera in there? Uh-uh. See, so these rules, oh, we got these rules that allow cameras, but will they let it? No. So it's practically without a, without a rule uh, in effect. Now, <clears throat> I was out in Oregon for a month. Guess what? They have cameras in their courtrooms. They allow people to film in their courtrooms. Not, <laughs> where has it caused a problem? Matter of fact, it has saved a lot of problems. It has saved people from abusive court system and it saves the courts from abusive people. It made, made it a whole lot easier uh, to deal with. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, the Minnesota Lawyer magazine came out with an article today on Michelle McDonald, um, kind of giving the hint that what's the deal with Mich Michelle McDonald and cameras? She has a camera out on her campaign uh, for Supreme Court justice, filming people, filming events, and 
for posterity's sake, you know, recording what she's going through, you know, in the process. Nothing wrong with that, okay? And so now she's arguing for cameras in the courtroom, and of course, Michelle McDonald got uh, charged with taking a picture in a courtroom, which was thrown out, but had to go through a couple of hearings and time and money uh, on this bogus charge by Judge David Knudsen, who Michelle McDonald had a federal lawsuit against, civil rights lawsuit against, uh, the whole uh, just a corrupt judge, as far as I'm concerned, and David Knutson should be out. Um, but so, what's the deal with Michelle McDonald and cameras? Transparency. Okay, it's about an open government, and right now our judicial branch of government has closed itself tightly. You know, <clears throat> do you think Judge Kurt right now in the appellate court likes the idea that I'm sitting here talking about him? you know, and criticizing him for his, one, his behavior in the courtroom, you're wrong. You know, address the issues, okay? Don't, you're wrong. Yeah, no, the law says, and let the attorney argue the case. You don't have to go, you're wrong. Well, you don't have to go, well, the guy could have done something else. Yeah, and he could do this too. I mean, that's what they don't want to see. But, you know, fortunately, because these are all professionals at the appellate court level and the Supreme Court level, we can have cameras. We should be able to have cameras. I, I don't think the court wants uh, criticism. They don't have any problem criticizing the attorneys. They don't have any problem writing orders here and lambasting attorneys. They just don't want themselves to be lambasted you know, and, and see what actually gets uh, said and done in that courtroom. Okay, uh, running out of time here. Okay, so, so here, here's the argue, argument. There's no binding or persuasive that suggests the defendant has a constitutional right to record her own trial, where there's nothing against it either. And we have a constitutional a, we have a constitution, ignores the constitution, that says you get a public trial and you have the right of the press. And my press is video. That's the best way I do video because these people do the talking the best. Me, not so much. That, those guys do a great job of talking. Okay? I want you to see it. I can't let you see it. They deny me the press and you, the citizen, the opportunity to see what's going on in that courtroom for their own political gain and for their own lack of checks and balances. And, and they just ignore the Constitution that gives her the right. Let's throw that out. There's nothing in case law. Well, you know, develop it. You know, so they had to publish this decision because they realized they made a decision that there was no case law on except for the Constitution. <laughs> uh, that's pretty good case law. Okay. Uh, so Chandler versus Florida holding no absolute constitutional bar to electronic media coverage. Uh, 1981. Uh, let's see. She also highlights the First Amendment's relationship to the right to a public trial. Uh, Finding, necess finding a necessarily implied First Amendment right to attend criminal trials. Shimoda essentially argues that by superimposing uh, a defendant's Sixth Amendment right to a public trial and the public's or media's First Amendment right to attend a trial or to record it over a defendant's objection, we would recognize that a defendant has a constitutional right to record her own uh, trial. Shimoda's constitutional argument faces at least three legal problems. First, courts lack authority to create a new constitutional right, a privilege vested in the people and regulated by a specific amendment process. Where's the new right? A public trial and the right of the press to be there. Where's the new right? The camera in the courtroom, why is that a new right? Second, we are aware of no court that has held or suggested 
that the asserted right to record one's own trial is implied by any express constitutional rights. And third, Shimoda's argument that this alleged Sixth Amendment right arises from the Sixth Amendment's intersection with the First Amendment is unsupported by the purpose of the Sixth Amendment. Pur purpose of the Sixth Amendment was right to have public trial so people could see what was going on and available. And so how do they change that and twist that, that the purpose of the Sixth Amendment doesn't intersect with the First Amendment? It's crazy. All right. Well, we're we're out of time here, so um, we'll have more on that next week. Uh, remember, March first, the precinct caucuses. If you don't go, somebody else is gonna uh, tell you how to run your life. So you better be there. And now we're at a real crisis in our United States, where your liberties could very well be taken away from you your First Amendment liberties, the right to own guns, uh, right to um, speech, religion, press, very well could be taken away from you depending on who this new, next Supreme Court justice is going to be. Um, so we'll get you more updates on that Shimoda case. We never got into what the word immediately means by the court. Uh, fascinating read. You need to go read it. All right, remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week. Sets on fire.